There are passages in the Bible that on first glance may seem to stand opposed to what you've always believed and what you've always thought. And I found that people, when they face passages like that, you have usually two different responses to it. One will be to ignore it and pretend like it's not there and try to always read around it and just ignore it. And then the other possibility is that eventually you can't keep pushing it aside and so you have to face it and work with it. And then you may just try to explain it away simply and keep it out of your mind, but it'll tend to keep coming back until you actually really deal with it and face it and focus on it. It's kind of like if um, my toilets are making a gurgling noise and they're not quite going down like they're supposed to and they cut off outside and have stuff coming out of it. I may need to get a snake. <laughs> I can continue pretending that it's not there, but eventually I'm probably going to have to face the uh, get a snake and take care of that. Uh, and sometimes doing number two will take... <laughs> sometimes to try to figure out how to solve a problem. Now sometimes problems aren't that difficult and I set all this up because of the passage this morning, if we don't pay attention to the context, you may think that it's saying something other than what it is. And so I'm going to help you understand what's going on with it. Um, context is very important. A lot of times we'll underestimate that. If you have a King James Version of the Bible, my main problem with it is that it sets up each verse as a separate thing. And it's very easy to lose the context of something if that's the way it's set up. You don't have the paragraphing and all that. Context sometimes involves also knowing and understanding the historical and cultural setting, but sometimes it's just making sure that you're getting the flow of the argument on the page. Years ago, when I was at UCLA, one of the languages I had to study was Akkadian. Akkadian is, there's two main dialects, Assyrian and Babylonian, and it's written with cuneiform. Now, any of you who have seen cuneiform, it looks confusing. You don't know the half of it, though. It is the worst writing system that has ever been developed in the history of the human race, I think, just about. There are 650 symbols, more or less. It's hard to say for sure exactly how many there are. What makes it particularly bad, though, is that the symbols are polyvalent. Now, what that means is that they are not always to be read in the same way. That is, sometimes you'll read it one way, sometimes you'll read it another way, sometimes there's up to 20 different ways of reading any given symbol. And what tells you how to read it is context. And so I learned in learning Akkadian how important context is. You can have two symbols sitting on the page and they'll be read in entirely different ways. They're right next to each other. For instance, the um, word for Ishtar or Inanna, it looks like a, I guess you'd say it kind of looks like an asterisk. You read it as a na na if there's another asterisk right in front of it. Otherwise, you would read it some other way. And so the first symbol you read is telling you what's coming up next in the line is the name of a deity. And then you read the name of the deity. It's a nasty system. We think that it was either developed to frustrate 20th century graduate students <laughs> or it was to ensure the scribes would maintain their uh, employment. Probably that's the reason it worked the way it did. Uh, anyway, regarding today's passage, uh, if you are of the opinion that you get to heaven based upon your good deeds, then your initial thought in reading this passage will be, yay, I'm right. 
But as my professor, not the Acadian professor, but one of the other professors I had at UCLA would say, ah, woe is you. <sighs> woe is you. Whenever test time came, he would say that. Um, so no, this passage is not going to be telling you that your salvation is based on whether you're good or bad. But it would be easy, without the context, to think that that may be what it's saying. So we'll look at it today, and I'll show you what's actually going on. So starting at Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good works seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for the opportunity we have to look at it, help us to make sense of it, to understand it in its context. In Jesus' name, amen. The key phrase here is repay each person according to what they have done. Now, your initial thought in hearing that may be that what this means is that, you know, if you're good, God will do nice things for you. If you're bad, God will do bad things to you. And of course, the problem with that understanding of what's going on here is that it's at odds with most of the rest of the biblical uh, revelation. As you look at the book of Job, for instance, and Job's friends are of the opinion that, you know, the reason you're suffering, Job, is because you've been a bad person. Please uh, tell us what bad thing you've done, repent, and then things will go good for you again. And, of course, the whole point of the book is that Job's friends are wrong. Their theology is the same as the theology of the devil. So, what are we going to do with this passage? Well, that phrase, according to what they have done. Let's look at a few other passages where that phrase shows up, because if you'll notice in your translation, that's in quotation marks. And it's because there's several other places in the Old Testament that shows up. So, Psalm chapter 62 Verses 11 through 12. One thing God has spoken. Two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love, and you reward everyone according to what they have done. Or Proverbs chapter 24, verses 10 through 12. If you falter in time of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we know nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Or back in Psalms again, chapter 28, verses 3 through 4. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil who speak cordially with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done, and bring back on them what they deserve. And then even in the New Testament, in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 16, verse 24 through 27, then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? For what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So, does this mean that salvation is based on works? That your eternal destiny is settled by how you behave? Does this mean that you know, karma is true? 
that if you're good, then God rewards you and makes your life turn out well, and if you're bad, then you're going to suffer and be miserable. And so you've got to figure out how to be good in order to make everything work out for you. Uh, no, this is not what this passage is talking about. Although that may, you know, you may struggle with this. What in the world is Paul doing here? Why is this argument being set up like this? <clears throat> One of the things that we learn, or at least should understand, is that being good is incredibly difficult because we're never good for an entirely selfless reason. That is, goodness is, that is, I do something good and I feel good because I did it. So it's not really, how good is the deed then, if I'm getting something out of it? Romans 2, 7 through 8, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, who will give eternal life, but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, will be wrath and anger, which doesn't help us get away from the idea that our salvation is based on whether we're good or not. In an episode of the TV sitcom Friends, entitled The One Where Phoebe Hates PBS, two characters, Phoebe and Joey, engage in a contest based on the theories of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Now, I could have taken a section of Immanuel Kant's work and read that to you and I just successfully put you all to sleep. <laughs> I decided instead to give us a clip of that episode from Friends. Yes. No matter what good deed you do, you will feel good about it, and therefore it's selfish. And being selfish is not a good thing, so you're screwed no matter what. <laughs> This is why in Isaiah chapter 64, verses 5 through 7, um, the prophet spoke about all our righteousness being as filthy rags. You come to the of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways, but when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. And this is the point that Paul is bringing us to. And it is Paul's point in his passage when he says that, uh, you know, the phrase that we kept saying over and over again, uh, reward each person according to their conduct, He's bringing us to the place in Romans where he'll say that um, the wages of sin is death. That is, his point that he's making is that no matter what we do, no matter how we behave, we are still, as it, you know, again, look at the context. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. What does it say? The wrath of God is revealed against all humanity. That is, we are all condemned. We are all under God's wrath. We are all getting what we deserve. That is, what we deserve is the wrath of God. And that's the point that Paul's going to be making here in this section of chapter 2 and going on for the next probably two or three weeks that we're going through this. That the only thing that we have coming to us is the wrath of God. That is, there isn't anything really good that we're doing. That no matter what we do, no matter what we attempt, whether we're Jew or Gentile, we are equally under the wrath of God. Uh, as in verse chapter 2, verse 1, if you go back and look at that, it says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. This section in chapter 2 is a condemnation of us. What Paul's trying to do is to set up the fact that we need God's salvation. That is, we're broken, there's nothing we can do. What we have earned, the wages that we have coming to us, the justice that we are due, 
is not part of the good news. It's the reason we need good news, because all the news up to this point is quite bad. And that's what Paul is doing. He's setting up an argument. And he's beginning, that is, he's, remember he's talking to Christians. So these are people that have been saved. But he's reminding them that your salvation is based not on what you've done or not done. It's based on what Jesus did. As salvation is not a consequence of our good deeds or our good actions. It's a consequence of what Jesus did on the cross. But he's got, Paul has to set up for us first that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, and so he says here, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage now at all? For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. The hope that will become clearer as we go through Romans is that though all are under God's wrath, that all are sinful, that all fall short, that all are condemned, that all are going to get what they have coming to them, but Jesus died for our sins. So he takes that away from us. That is, Jesus is the one who's going to get paid for what we have earned. We don't have to get that paycheck. Jesus got it instead. And so don't lose sight of the theme of the book of Romans, if you remember what that theme is, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I am proud of the good news. It is God's powerful way of saving all people who have faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Good news tells how God accepts everyone who has faith, but only those who have faith. It is just as the scripture says. People God accepts because their faith will live. And so that's the hope of this passage. But we haven't gotten to that section yet. Right now we're still at the point where we're seeing that we need God's salvation. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had this morning to look into your God, into your word. Help us to remember what we've learned. Help us to pay attention to the context and to understand this. In Jesus' name, amen.